Thank you very much. So yeah, I'm um, working for uh, SAP, security researcher there, since 10 years. Uh, this is a joint work with many other colleagues. You can see all the names here. From SAP and also from uh, Fondazione Bruno Kreisler uh, in Italy, it's done uh, under SSNTIS, an European project. And unfortunately, Avinash, that is the main investigator, the main actor for this work, couldn't make for the conference, so I will be alone on, on stage. Um, so, some uh, context and motivation to start. Uh, last year, we presented uh, in Rome another work about uh, black box security testing. And uh, among the attack strategies we were using there, uh, we were also uh, having a login cross-site request forgery, in particular used for uh, account activation URL. And uh, this, this is a new attack vector that we introduced uh, uh, last year, and uh, we detected quite some number of vulnerabilities with this. And so we, we decided, uh, why don't we have a closer look to cross-site request forgery in general for what concerns authentication and identity management functionalities. So this is more or less our uh, uh, motivation. And we wanted to study this uh, with respect to pervasiveness, the testing strategies that are needed in order to detect these kind of issues, impact and severity. Okay, so um, I know it's after lunch, so perhaps you will fall asleep in a while, so let me give a quick preview so that if you fall asleep, at least you have an idea what we did. So we inspected literature on cross-site request forgery for authentication and identity management, and from now on, we refer to this as authentication c -surf, okay? And we derive security testing strategies, from there, we run experiments on Alexa uh, top websites, refine our strategies through the experiments, and then we created the semi-automated tool just to help us during a second phase of the, of the experiments. And in doing so, we detected many vulnerabilities. You can see some, uh, some names there. Uh, one in the Google search engine, uh, one for Microsoft also it was in Bing, but also for, uh, for other things. To eBay, the last one is uh, anonymous, so we can't disclose. Uh, but he's a very uh, famous uh, uh, smartphone company. I, I will come back on this later on, so if you don't fall asleep, you will get the details. Um, the outline, I will start with some background introductory information, then our methodology, the experiments we have been running, and the results we obtain, some conclusion, and I hope we will have time to go in some open discussion, because really I think there, is, there are things to discuss, so also offline, that would be very interesting for me. Okay, so cookies. So I, I'm pretty sure everybody knows about the cookies, so I'm going to say trivial things here, but uh, yeah, websites set cookies. And they set cookies even before user authentications. Hmm? And these cookies then are sent automatically with every outgoing request to the, to the website under the same origin policy. Why you have to introduce cookies? Yeah, because cross-site request forgeries really uh, uh, is uh, somehow strictly bound to the, to the cookie mechanism. So, how many of you knows about cross-site request forgery? Can you raise your hand? Okay, yeah, a lot of people. So, I can be very fast here, fantastic. So, let's imagine we have uh, uh, the victim here uh, that is already connected to, this, to his bank and is visiting a website called mailis.com. He sees a cute cat there and then without that the user perceive it, uh, there, there is a, a, a cross-site request that the attacker is performing. This goes through the browser of the user, and with this action, uh, the attacker makes the user transferring money to itself. So, why this works? It works because the cookies of the victim are within the request. And if the bank is not properly protected against cross-site request forgery, the attacker was able to forge that request and therefore to get this money transferred. So this basically happens because the website, uh, in this case the bank, cannot really distinguish between uh, what was a user-intended action uh, and what was the browser-initiated one. And uh, uh, what, what is the cause also is the fact that the state change in action, in this case is a transfer of money, uh, was, an, was predictable for the attacker. So the attacker could forge that request completely. So these are the main two issues for cross-site request forgery. And now let me dig into um, two variants of cross-site request forgery. So one is about post-authentication actions. We just saw an example, bank transfer, happens when the user is already authenticated, right? Uh, and you can have many others. 
Uh, so you can have a delete account, uh, uh, any action that happens after the user authenticated uh, fit this category that we call post-authentication action. And uh, um, when you look at, uh, at the web for uh, definition, cross-site request forgery mainly amount to these post-authentication actions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to point to this because maybe it's one of the issues for, for the number of vulnerabilities that, that we discovered. Um, and uh, many serious attacks have been reported. I will not go into this because, I mean, were not attacked discovered by us, and you can browse the, 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 the literature, the web, you will find many of them. Um, let me go on the other variant of cross-site request forgery, so pre-authentication cross-site request forgery. In here, what happened is that basically the, the victim doesn't have yet an authentication context with the website, right? And so what, what can happen is that basically the attacker perhaps can forge the login request. Right? He can put his own credential there, and uh, if the website is not protected, from that point on, the victim will be logged into the website under the identity of the, the attacker, right? So he's in the attacker account. And from that moment on, the attacker can track what the victim is doing. Huh? So this, as you can imagine, can be a privacy issue, and we will see it can also go beyond privacy. But uh, probably there is a bit less awareness in this respect, at least in the community. Uh, we will see the results we got that seems to, to go in more or less in this direction. Huh? There are some articles explaining how to, uh, yeah, what is login cross-site request forgery, how to defend, etc., etc. But maybe the community is not uh, uh, enough aware about this kind of problem. Um, and yeah, as I was saying, privacy is one of the issues. Huh? Uh, there was some attack reported on PayPal where basically the victim sensitive bank data were, uh, were uh, uh, stolen by, by the attacker. But it can go also beyond privacy. Yeah. Uh, there is an interesting blog from NetSparker where they are describing how you can put together this uh, self-cross-site scripting together with this, uh, uh, let's say, pre-authentication cross-site request forgery. And uh, recently also we saw that, uh, we saw something interesting. I mean, I, I, will, I will come back to this later. And uh, we were able to do account hijack uh, by, by using pre-authentication cross-site request forgery, by leveraging cross-site request forgery. Okay. So... Our focus for this work is authentication cross-site request forgery. So what does it mean? It means we focus on those processes affecting identity, authentic, uh, identity management functionalities of a website. And uh, uh, we want these uh, attacks to have two kinds of impacts to fit in our category. The first impact is that uh, the attacker can log in the victim to an attacker-controlled account, so is this uh, pre-authentication uh, cross-site request forgery we were describing just before. The second one can be the attacker can log in to the victim accounts. So th these are the two kinds of impacts we are uh, trying to, to achieve. And the second one would be post-authentication cross-site request forgery. Okay? So we have this distinction between pre-authentication and post-authentication. So in this, is out of scope. We, 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 there is something out of scope, scope, like, for instance, the bank transfer, hmm? because it has nothing to do with authentication and identity management. Log out. Why? Because these two impacts cannot be achieved by the attacker pushing you uh, out of the website. So this doesn't mean that these two actions are not important. These are extremely important, so you have to protect. Uh, but simply they were out, for, uh, out of scope for us, just because we, we wanted to have a scope, right, to, to, to do our experiments. Um, so the methodology. Um, yeah, first we, we went we, we, we read through the, through the literature to, to see which kind of attacks were already reported, and we try to identify the processes hmm, that uh, are important to consider, which are the attack strategies that were used so that we can uh, somehow derive testing strategies in order to, yeah, to be more efficient and to know what to do in order to, to discover these kind of things. And these are the processes we, we focused on. So you can see there are pre-authentication actions and post-authentication actions. Uh, you, can, you start with registration, so this is something you have to be careful about. Also account activation. Normally this uh, is just, you know, when you, when you register to a, web a website, you get an email with a, a URL that uh, allows you to activate the account, right? You click on that and your account is activated. Uh, password reset, that is not, uh, uh, you know, the, the password change is something different. Here, you, you really, you want to reset the password. 
uh, and uh, uh, then you have uh, login done form based or SSO based. Hmm? And on the post action side, post authentication action side, we look at uh, SSO based account association and uh, email and password change. So then we created manual strategies to test uh, cross site request forgery with respect to, to all these processes. And uh, we assessed, refined the strategies through our experiments. And then we, we created a small prototype, semi automated one, to make our life easier. And then we were again uh, testing on the same experiments than before to, to check that the tool was accurate at that point, and also new ones. So, um, just to give you an idea of one of these testing strategies that uh, we, we, we extracted from, from the literature. So, this is the example of uh, uh, the, the single sign on login process. So what we have to do in order to check for cross-site request forgery, uh, we have to ask the tester to perform the SSO login process by using the tester account hmm, and to intercept the HTTP request that contains the authentication token. And once that is done, we copy from this uh, uh, intercepted request the method, the URL, the body, so all the different parameters that we need. We clear the browser cookies and reset the, the proxy. We visit again the, 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 the website under test with a new session, so a clean session. Uh, and we send that request that we intercepted before uh, with the, uh, the same uh, HTTP method, URL, bodies, etc. But what we change is the referrer just to, to be sure uh, that, uh, I mean, if there is one of these protection uh, like origin referrer in the header, this, uh, this will not uh, um, um, say. Uh, change the result of our, of our work. Um, and then what the tester has to do is just to check whether it is logged or not. Hmm? So this is the, test the testing strategies, uh, the testing strategy for uh, SSO login. And what we did is uh, we tried to think, okay, how can we, there are a lot of things that you, that you can automate right here. And uh, uh, what we were uh, coming out in the end is just that the tester execute the process. So this is a functional execution of the process. It's not something difficult to be done. The tester just provide uh, uh, some string that uh, allows the tool to understand when there is a request going to the website with the credential of the tester. So I don't know, it could be a substring of, my, of the uh, tester account password. Uh, and then all the rest is done automatically till the end where basically you need to understand whether you were logged or not. And again here, it can be just the tester saying yes, no, or it can be the tester providing an input to what is called a flag uh, a flag could be, you know, when you, when you log in a, in a website, normally you have something like welcome Luca, welcome whatever. Uh, so that could be the flag that needs to be checked in order to understand whether the login was successful or not. And so with, uh, with this, uh, uh, basically this, this is what we, we use in order to automate this, uh, this uh, to semi-automate this uh, testing strategy uh, in, our, in our tool. Okay, experiments. Uh, we focus on the Alexa top uh, 1500 and uh, we split these in three ranges and we focus on the most important 100 sides of each range. And uh, uh, we basically had in total more or less 130 websites here that we analyzed manually. Uh, and most, the, the, the others that we didn't consider mainly was the, because of uh, language barriers. Um, and uh, here I'm going, I'm going very fast on the results, but if you're interested, you can just take the paper and you can uh, look to the details there. But uh, what we found is that almost 70% of the websites were vulnerable to authentication cross-site request forgery. And what was interesting for us to see that, uh, in particular, this was true for pre-authentication cross-site request forgery, meaning that the, the incidence of pre-authentication cross-site request forgery is much, much higher than the incidence of post-authentication cross-site request forgery. And so here you, you can start questioning a bit why, uh, and maybe the awareness is the main issue. So this is speculation, we don't know, uh, but uh, I think it's reasonable to, to, to raise this question. Um, and uh, here, I mean, you will not be able to, to read this data, and I don't think we have the time to go into this data, but maybe it's not even important. You can go into the paper, but it's just to, to, to drill down a bit into the, into the results for each one of the processes that we were analyzing. Hmm? Um, so then we perform the test with a tool, with a semi-automated tool, 
And initially, we just uh, repeated the, the test on the, on the websites we analyzed before. And we were able to rediscover 71% of the vulnerabilities. In the remaining 36 cases, well, there was a in, in most of the cases, the vendor fixed the issue. Um, also because if we, be between the two experiments, we had a couple of months uh, difference. So it's fair enough. Um, and in five cases, the tool crashed. So, but, and we, I mean, we didn't have a lot of time to understand why. And uh, so, also then we, what we did is to take uh, uh, websites from the ranges that we didn't consider. So the blue ones, we take uh, yeah more or less ten by by each one of these ranges, and uh, we run our uh, semi-automated prototype there, uh, and uh, more or less we got the same trend. So again, uh, around the 70% vulnerabilities, uh, vulnerable website, and also in terms of uh, when you go into the drill down, more or less the results were the same. We were giving a bit more. Uh, in the selection criteria, we were giving more priority to those websites having single sign-on login and single sign-on uh, base account association because we didn't have a lot of samples in the manual experiment, so we wanted to increase a bit here. Uh, but it's the only difference with respect to the selection criteria we used before. Um, and so, yeah, these are, uh, these are again uh, the, the, some of the, the uh, results we obtain. Um, I have a video about uh, Google and eBay. Maybe we can just look at, uh, at the one of Google, uh, how we discovered the vulnerability. And this is on the, on the search engine. Maybe I move to, to the next one. And then I, I will come back. I hope the video is going gonna, is gonna to work. Does it? Yeah. OK, so it's without voice, so it will be me talking. So here is the attacker, basically, that is uh, preparing uh, the, 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 um, the HTTP request that he wants to, to send as cross-site request forgery. So now he's intercepting it, uh, he's uh, copying. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, yeah, the process is blocked. Mm -hmm. And now basically, well, you can imagine uh, you, you have to trick the victim in clicking on that link. It could be done uh, by sending an email, by uh, contacting the victim through the chat, or by uh, convincing the victim to go on the website uh, controlled by the attacker, right? And now the victim, uh, what, uh, yeah, he will just click there. And by clicking, basically, if you reload the page, you are not anymore uh, on the victim page, but you are on the victim is spoofed account. And uh, now if the victim is doing, and, and I mean, honestly, you can be very, you can do some targeting attacks, so it's very difficult to be, to be spoofed by, by the victim, right? So uh, you can keep the same icon, etc. And now if the victim is going to do a search, or all the search the victim will do, will be basically visible for, for the attacker, right? Because the attacker has the, now the, uh, the, the, the possibility to go into that account, to see the, the history. That actually, I think is what it's going to do, yeah? And uh, it will be uh, seeing all the search that the victim was doing. So actually, uh, Google confirmed the, 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 the vulnerability. Uh, also, we, we found something similar also for Bing. Um, and uh, Microsoft provided us a bounty, but uh, Google didn't because they, were, they said they, they were already aware about the vulnerability. Well, damn it. Maybe I go back just a second here. Yeah, and uh, uh, other vulnerability, uh, this one was, was quite interesting. So it's a smart, smartphone uh, uh, company. And uh, through that uh, vulnerability, basically, the attacker was able to, to see all the information that were available on the phone of the user. So the gallery uh, with all the photos, the SMS that were sent, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, yeah. Um, so. In conclusion, yeah, we, we propose uh, manual and semi-automatic testing strategies. We tested uh, uh, top websites and discovered 70% to be vulnerable. We responsibly disclose uh, our findings. And uh, perhaps more interesting is to discuss next. So next, of course, we would like to reach some uh, uh, higher automation at the moment. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure it's really possible to, to really test automatically for cross-site request forgery. Maybe yes. Uh, if you have some good idea. Um, but uh, what, what we saw is that, uh, uh, say, the tester, already now with the semi-automated tool, the tester doesn't have to do a lot of effort in order to test for these kind of issues. Uh, 
But more important maybe is, uh, would be to raise more awareness, uh, especially about pre-authentication cross-site request forgery. It's true that uh, uh, the, the, the severity depends a lot on the website, on the data that are on the website. Uh, but uh, yeah, at the same time, from, at least from, from our results, from our experiments, we had uh, a number of vulnerabilities that were serious in this respect, and that uh, probably would require some more action from the community. And so one idea would be uh, why not uh, having uh, this kind of uh, awareness also in the OWASP testing guide that at the moment doesn't uh, present anything about pre-authentication cross-site request forgery. Um, indeed, uh, just to, to dig a bit more uh, in the pre-authentication cross-site request forgery, so the, the main difference is that uh, here is not the attacker that is making the victim executing an action on the victim account, but is the, basically the attacker is just leading the victim to authenticating as the attacker, right? So it's mainly a privacy issue, for sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, as soon as uh, you start having, I don't know, imagine the account page that is not very well protected with respect to cross-site scripting. Uh, this is what uh, would be give rise to self cross-site scripting uh, that perhaps are a bit uh, yeah, underestimated because what, the, what could be the exploitation of that, right? It can be just uh, the, the, the user authenticating in his account and, and attacking itself. Doesn't make sense. I mean, it, that, that area is already protected. But uh, if you, if you uh, combine that with the pre-authentication cross-site request forgery, at that point, uh, the situation becomes more serious because the user, the victim, will go into an account that is uh, controlled by the attacker the attacker can uh, just put uh, some uh, JavaScript, uh, whatever, and at that point, the victim will execute that JavaScript. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, recently, we found something interesting. We still have to digest this, but uh, we want to, to transparently provide this information to you. Uh, so we found a way that uh, uh, we had an identity provider having a pre-authentication cross-site request forgery. And uh, through that, mm -hmm, uh, we were able to do account ejecting via a service provider. I think I have a slide. Yeah. Okay. So I, I can't disclose who is the, 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 the identity provider. We, we didn't uh, got the green light to do so. Uh, but uh, yeah, you have, what you have to imagine is the following situation. So the identity provider has a pre-authentication cross-site request forgery. Uh, now the attacker can make the victim authenticating as the attacker and the identity provider. And uh, let's imagine now that the service provider has uh, a single sign-on base account association uh, feature, and uh, that uh, this feature is protected against cross-site request forgery. So this was the case, right? So we were, uh, we were not able to attack the service provider directly. But uh, as soon as we combine, uh, we, we, we uh, exploit the pre-authentication cross-site request forgery, then we were able to associate the attacker account on the identity provider to the victim account on the service provider. So it looks like uh, the pre-authentication somehow was a launching pad for, uh, for this account eject. Um, and uh, yeah, this is more or less it. I mean, we didn't have a discussion about defense uh, for cross-site request forgery, and there are defenses. Uh, so uh, well-known secret validation token, custom headers, etc. They're applicable to both post and pre-authentication. Uh, there are also novel concepts that are proposed. Probably, uh, yeah, you are aware about same site cookies. That is very cool, and uh, it can, uh, you know, prevent a lot of cross-site request forgeries. Uh, but maybe not all of them. For instance, if you think to single sign-on scenarios, uh, that would not work, right? And also, if you think to account activation, where you get an email and you have to go on the, your email provider and to click on a link, also in that case, it would not work. So, uh, all in all, the recommendation is be aware about uh, pre-authentication cross-site request forgery. Ensure the defenses are applied for those cases that are not automatically covered. Uh, for instance, that are not automatically covered if you use same site cookies. And uh, test the critical actions of your website. So this would be uh, yeah, the, the recommendation. And with that, I think is, uh, is all. I don't know how much time I consume, maybe. Okay, Lucas, thank you very much for that. Very interesting indeed. Um, now, back to the audience then. Uh, anyone like to interrogate that a little bit or uh, any questions? Any questions? Uh, 
Can you gonna get, go again quickly into what you did with the single sign on the last one? Yeah. This one? Yeah. So do you have a specific question or? Yeah. Or you just want to see the slide? I want to see the slide. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Well, the slides will be available, right? And yeah, yeah. Again, look, maybe from the defensive point of view, uh, you were mentioning also about the tokens, etc. Uh, are, are there any other defenses that you would particularly recommend? You know. Well, it really depends on the on the process, but in general, I mean the the um, uh, the anti cross site request forgery token. Uh, is the one that, if you can put it in place, is uh, probably the, the, the most general one because it would work also for, uh, for single sign-on, etc. So this is, I mean, I think it's pretty, pretty well used. Yeah. So it's the one I will use. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Please put your hand up. Thank you. Oh, oh sorry. Sorry, uh, you mentioned same-side cookies as a defense mechanism, is that... Can, can you speak closer to the mic? Yeah. Uh, same side cookies. Uh, is this a defense mechanism for pre-authentication CSRF? Um, Thank you. I mean, if it is form-based uh, login, yes, I would say it could work. Uh, again, if it is uh, SSO-based, it would not work, right? Because you want to go to the, to the identity provider, so it's a different domain. So it really depends on the on the specific scenario that you are uh, that you are considering, and also for uh, for the account activation, it's not something you can do with a cookie, right? So you have to to put something in that URL that you are sending to the to the user, uh, and uh, in that URL there must be something that allows you to, yeah, you know, to uh, to be to be sure that that request is coming from the user that was registering at some point. Okay. <clears throat> so in your example on Google, you used Firefox as a browser. I'm just wondering if um, you also tried it with Chrome for, uh, I'm thinking of uh, features like channel binding and referred token binding that is used by Google services. Is, can this somehow be used to protect against CSERF or do you think, uh, or have you tried it with Chrome? We, I didn't try. But I was not the one executing the experiment, so here I, uh, yeah, it would be great to have Avinash to <laughs> to, to answer that. Uh, I I wouldn't know. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't know. Any other questions? Uh, you mentioned the paper um, and mentioned, you know, the, for more information to check it out. Where would we access that? Uh, so in the, can I move back to, can I change the slide? Yeah. Where is it? Ooh. Yeah, here you have uh, two links to the, to the PDF of, of the two papers. So if you, if you access the slides, you will uh, you will be able to to get the p the, the the access to the paper. Right. I think there's someone else over here. No. I've been seeing a lot of newer sites that don't use cookies to maintain session. They use uh, uh, the same token sent over uh, an authentication header instead of a cookie. Are there vectors for CSRF against that? Uh, yeah, well, what, I mean, uh, also in, in that case, you can have the, the anti-cross-site request forgery token, right? Uh, the, the, the point that normally what you do is to, to bind cryptographically that token to the session. So whether the session is uh, handled through a cookie or is handled in a different way, doesn't matter much, right? So it's the server side that then has to, has to check it. Uh, I'm not sure, however, that in that, in, in that way you can do something like uh, uh, double submitting cookies. Probably you cannot. So it would be 
less efficient, but, uh, but in principle, yes, you can protect with the same mechanisms, right? No more questions? No, that's great then. Thanks very much, Luca. Thank you. Thank a lot. you.